But the thing is, if we're told in the Bible, you know, that, that we shouldn't be dabbling in this kind of occult behavior and this kind of stuff, and, and there's nowhere that we're allowed to, in, in, multi, in media and news and stuff like that, nothing from the Bible is ever taught anymore at all. Uh, we're only being taught now the other side. What's up, what other side? The, the occult side, the, the, that, the, you know, to be, do, as thou, do as thou wilt, <laughs> you know, it, it's promoted. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, well, what's the question you're asking me? Do I think that's the true? Or? Yeah. Like, what, what do you make of that? Like, because you were saying that you think it's okay that, we sh- that we're adults now and that we should be exposed to this occult information. But if we're not also exposed to, to information from the Bible telling us uh, not to dabble in these occult activities, uh, how, how uh, can we make a fair decision as adults? Well, again, I think, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm, for me, the word occult means that, again, we're exposed to in this idea. This, for, for me, the word occult means secret. It's secret knowledge. Right. It doesn't mean anything dark or, or black. It's kind of become to mean that. And I do use that word occult in those terms in that book. Uh, and I use the word esoteric to be more something um, some of the spiritual phenomena are something that is behind the world that we live in, you know, uh, and, and that could be we look at a plant and we see a plant and it looks a certain way, but the, the esoteric spiritual knowledge behind that plant is really requires you to study it and look at it really, you know, spend a lot of time like, like the German poet Goethe would have done. Um, and to really like um, feel that in your, you know, you can nearly become one with the thing so you can really understand it. Um, but so this idea of, of dark of of occultism on a, in a dark level, in what we might call um, left hand path kind of black magicians, if we want to use that term, if we want to use occult in that term, um, yeah, that's true. What you're saying, I think we we are only being told certain things, and it's actually from I think left hand black cultists. Mm-hmm. That uh, are working in the media, are working throughout, you know, many areas, um, and so an advertisement on TV, it's that simple. An advertisement on TV that um, kind of brainwashes you into buying something because it's bypassing your free will in a way. Um, that is, that is a certain kind of black magic, I, I would think. Um, as you know, I mean, smoking cigarettes. Everybody knows that kids are, are naturally not drawn towards cigarettes. And when you get older, you know, when you're in your tw- late twenties, thirties, you tend not to to be interested in those things if you haven't already started them. So that's not the case for everybody, but it's generally the case. So the best place to get people hooked on cigarettes, which I'm sure cigarette companies know very, very well, is when you're a teenager. Cause that's when you really start to smoke. That's when you're impressionable. So even though it's illegal to sell cigarettes, it is in this country anyway to, to people under eighteen. Cigarette manufacturers know that that's the age they need to um, entice them into into smoking. Otherwise, they don't have a potential market, um, you know, for later on for the year for the years later on when they when all the smokers that have passed on, they need the next generation to smoke, and they need to get them at thirteen or fourteen. So they have to use, despite all the the warnings and cigarette packets that you have here and the quite graphic images that. They have and say they know it doesn't work because it it's that's that's not where those keep you know, that's not where you capture somebody you capture somebody in their feeling life you know they mm. feel like a cigarette you don't think about having a cigarette you feel like one so trying to trying to access them they're trying to tell them stuff in their heads is not going to work so it's a kind of a game because they're telling you we're, we're giving you a warning and stuff but at the same time it's not the that's not the area that's going to affect their decision making in regards to smoking. It's it's a feeling, right? Because they're not they're not making it they're not so making think, they're not making it glamorous and not to smoke. They're not making it jingles and you know romantic not to smoke. You know they're not in, uh, appealing to those kind of uh, emotions uh, to cause us not so, to. Yeah. So, they, so they appeal to emotions, and I think you get the same in a lot of industries. Like, you know, they appeal to the emotions. They bypass the the. the you know, the thinking aspect of the person. And that's the aspect that's free. You know, we, we're free to think our own thoughts and, you know, um, we're mature enough to be able to make those decisions. So, for example, we had an, abor- an abortion referendum here in Ireland. For, we, we haven't had it where it's illegal in this country, but you might have heard it was passed yesterday, uh, on Friday. 
Um, and I think that was a campaign really where, you know, that, that there wasn't really a, the, the yes vote w- wanted to be passed. You know, they, there was, it was, a, it was, a, it was an agenda that's been set off quite far down the road. Um, but in order to get people to think that they're thinking for themselves, they have to, they have to make them think that, well, I'm voting freely out of my own, you know, um, ability to think for myself, etc. But I really don't think so. I think what we got a big problem we have, just like you're you're talking about today, is we use a lot of things um, to um, manipulate people into thinking that they're they're they need to think like this. So, for example, human rights might be one. You know, um, are you know they're 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 labels that are put on things to make people think that they're thinking for good causes right. or for, for in a good way. Uh, you, you, you go off and get this, what they call the pincher effect, where or you might hear of the, you know, the kind of Hegelian system where problem, reaction, solution. So they set up a, a problem and then they react there, the reaction to it, and then they come in with the solution. So they've kind of manipulated the people to cry out for the thing that, uh, that, that was there at the beginning of the whole agenda. You know, they, they, public relations or well, do, do you know what I mean um, so I think that in that sense yeah the, um, you know these occult groups were were possibly behind um, certain aspects of, of the 60s uh, there are lots of groups behind it in the sense of there's people out to manipulate the Beatles and that culture for money there's be- people out to manipulate it for their own personal prestige there's people out to manipulate it um, for deeper reasons, because they want culture to go a certain way, uh, and I think I think the Beatles were very, very. Um, I definitely think Lennon and Harrison were very in tune with that at some point, which is why they got very disillusioned with with being Beatles and you know being manipulated in many ways. Um, and I think there's quite enough evidence that shows that in terms of you know their comments on being Beatles or or not period of their life um, Harrison before he died would became a supporter of what's called uh, it was it the um, the natural party is that what it's called which basically was um, you know he said you know to make people become more conscious of themselves and more conscious of the world they live in which of course he said is not what politicians want people to do so um you know, they don't want us to become very conscious of what's going on in a way. So it's easier. So so they were quite aware, I think, of of, of those those forces there, you know, behind in, in certain aspects of their of their um, career or their life. You know, yeah, yeah. Just the other day, I was listening to Breakfast with the Beatles. You know, we have it here every Saturday and Sunday. Sunday morning, many many stations play it, different versions of it. Breakfast with the Beatles. And they were playing these clips, and uh, it was right after they had broken up. And they were asking John, uh, "Would they get back together?" And he says, "Well, Matt, we had, we never had, we didn't have any control back then, you know. And now that we're, we've gotten we've gotten, gotten away from that, and we have more control, yeah, maybe we'll get back together." Because so he described this: they're not having any control back then. Now, certain things, uh, and you talk about this, um, like almost like a spiritual uh, driven force uh, propelling the Beatles. But but early on, even even in the album Help, uh, they're they're standing there with their body positions. Aren't those Crowley uh, type of uh, language? Like Crowley would teach that to stand in those kind of positions. Yeah, well, well, I, yeah, I've come across a number of things, and I do mention that in the book. Um, that, but but uh, yeah, there there is um, the, the semaphores. Yeah, so they're they're also they seem to look very like certain gestures that are used in, um, or at least the Alistair Crowley shows pictures of it in, in some of his books. But I think there's a few things there. And, and in the film itself, film for help, there's a lot of esotericism in it. Uh, there's this whole Indian thing. Right. And there's a, there's a real negative reaction, funnily enough, to India, to this, 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 um, what you might call uh, esoteric knowledge coming from the east, um, and um, which in a way is it, there's wonderful knowledge there, but whether it's right for the west or not in this time is a different thing. And whether there were sources, which I do mention in the book, 
and which certain people have pointed to that certain West Eastern traditions that are not necessarily healthy for the West um, were brought in very specifically to disrupt and to to um, cause confusion and chaos within the West and within within our within our certain within our, our consciousness. I, I think it's possible that these things got into the the work, but I think you have to look at. First of all, artists, you know, there was, there was photographers who took the pictures. There mm. was other people around them um, that were kind of interested in these things and may have influenced the Beatles and most definitely did influence the Beatles in, you know, how they interacted with um, these, these, these things like Crowley or the occult or, or just artists in general and philosophers and um other writers, you know, they introduced these people introduced them to lots of things, which which they needed to do in order for them to then you know expand and have things to think about and talk about and think about them. Um, and Crowley seemed to be one of the things that was kind of of interest to the counterculture, particularly in Britain and to some extent maybe in America. Um, as was Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, as was um, you know other kind of science fiction and kind of mystical works. Uh, Alice in Wonderland was obviously a big influence because Lennon had been influenced by that whole tradition of Victoria, Victorian fairy tales and um, that kind of thing from, a, from his childhood. Um, and so whether they are specifically, you know, dabbling in, in the kind of occult magic of Crowley um, themselves, I, I find it a bit hard to, I don't think that that's the case. There may be others around them that we're using the Beatles there to plant certain things. Um, and I think that's more, more likely. And then and in that sense, the Beatles were not free to be totally in control of, of everything they did. But the reason why I say I don't think the Beatles were so, so influenced by, we were so consciously involved in that whole thing, particularly around that period, is because, first of all, they were, they were very busy writing songs, they were very busy touring, they were very busy making films. Uh, they were very busy doing interviews and other things. I just don't know how they would have dedicated so much time to, or could have, to, to really getting to know Crowley and magic uh, or other types of magic. I, I think it's something you'd probably have to spend a long time studying and practicing. Um, and I just don't think at that point in their in their careers, I mean, that's only 60, around 65. So, you know, they're only three, you know, they're, they're just on a roller coaster then. And I think... Uh, I don't think it's possible that they would have known too much. It's more probable that later on, after the Beatles, that they they had more time and more they were a bit more mature and probably could absorb that stuff much easier. And uh, you know, they were only kids really then, running around. What were they interested in? Getting rich and and you know, meeting girls and playing their music. I don't think they were not interested in in black magic or Crowley or anything at that point. But they were maybe people around them that allowed those influences to creep into the music and therefore once they once it's there in the in the culture and very much in popular culture then it maybe kind of starts to exert an influence. But I don't think I mean there's a lot made about Crowley and I think Crowley is you know, I don't I'm not saying he's not he's not a negative influence or something like that, but they're certainly much darker occultists than Crowley around, you know. Uh, I mean Crowley was really Someone who had an interest and, and, and dabbled in those things, but I think I don't think on a very I don't think he was was a, um, really really that adept as some as some people others maybe would have been who we probably won't even ever hear about because that's how adept they are. You know, they're very much in the shadows. But I think Crowley very much was you know he was a seemingly a, a secret agent for the British. Um, so you know he was someone who was you know involved in lots of things and interested in lots of things and certainly did have an influence on popular culture. But um, you know I think there's a lot more made out of it than there actually than there actually was. And and, and his appearance on the Sgt. Pepper's cover I think is again you know from what I've come across you know there's some debate over who put it who put it, put it on the cover, but it's more likely it seemed to be a choice of Lennon's who did it probably to just. Uh, annoy people, you know, more, more than anything. I mean, Lennon is definitely a very clever fella, and he's very artistic, but he's very much in his head, I think. You know, it's, it's ideas that he likes to know about and play with. 
for him to spend time trying to figure out how to cast spells or do things like that, I just don't think he had 